Why the hell does anybody need a home server? A question I get asked way more than you might think. And in this video, we are going to explore that, whether if you're somebody who is just now looking into this or you're an IT professional. There is reasons for everybody to run a server at home, whether that be simply having fun all the way to breaking the chains of corporate services that harvest your data. And no, I'm not saying everybody needs a full-fledged rack mount system with servers, switches, and other IoT devices. This can be as simple as like a two-bay NAS, a Raspberry Pi, or even a small budget mini PC. My very first home server was just a little small Intel Celeron PC running Jellyfin on it and that's it. Now, no matter what hardware or even software you run, our sponsor Twingate is going to give you a easy way to connect, control, and manage just about everything on your home network without needing to use a traditional VPN. Unlike a traditional VPN gateway, there's no internet exposure. Spinning up a connector on your network can be done as a few simple commands or even installed on your desktop computer. And then you can use their client software on most devices out there and connect to your file system services and even directly to your local IP addresses in the terminal. Once this is all set up, it just requires a simple login to connect and you can even set up two-factor authentication or link up to an authenticator app for added security. All user data flows are encrypted and you can check out their trust center documentation to learn more. You can add multiple users, groups, and control access for devices and services depending on the specific permissions that you set. And best of all, this is completely free for up to five users, so make sure you go down below and check out the link to get started with Twingate. Number one, local file backups and shares. Now, before we get into this, to be clear, I'm not saying you necessarily need to completely ditch cloud services. Personally, I'm still using Google Drive as a backup platform. I have a business account connected to my Gmail, I have two terabytes of their Drive data storage, and I use it for backing up business documents, uh, video production projects, sharing them with various people, and as a backup mechanism for my personal photos within that business account. But solely relying on these cloud services does come at a risk. In that risk is completely trusting whatever company it is with all of your data. Something that could affect your data could be something as simple as a policy change. Maybe there's a file in your drive that Google notices that they're not, not too fond of. And that did actually happen to me one time with a phone flashing tool. And all of that can result in loss of critical data. And that's why I have everything in something like this, a NAS, a network attached storage device. And I use Drive as a simple off-site backup solution for the really important stuff. Having both that local and cloud option gives me peace of mind whether if one of them goes out, I still have access to those important files. And then there's the cost saving aspect of that. You can pay $10 a month for some cloud service subscription or you can pay $80 one time for a four terabyte hard drive. And after you get a NAS, you factor in the cost of power, it does pay for itself in about a couple years. And then there's just the annoyance of for some reason you're not able to access the internet. And then if you have a local copy of everything, that just doesn't matter anymore. Additionally, with something like this, it gives you the option to have a variety of network shares. And that makes it really nice to access the same kind of file structure on a variety of different devices. For example, I have a MacBook Air that has 256 gigabytes of storage. And as we all know, the cost for upgrading storage or RAM on Mac devices is incredibly expensive. And for me personally, the smaller storage size on the devices is really no big deal at all. As when I'm working with video production projects or I'm downloading anything that's really over like a gigabyte, I don't store any of the files on that specific device locally. Instead, I just set a project directory inside of a network share or I set my download directory into a network share. And with my Wi-Fi speeds, or better yet, if I happen to be working on the device as a direct ethernet connection, I don't notice a performance difference at all, as opposed to if the file was actually on the device's drive. Number two, and that is media streaming. And this is probably what I would consider to be the thing that I use the most. And when I mean media streaming, I'm talking about self-hosted movies, TV shows, eBooks, things like that. Now, if you're somebody who like rarely will Chromecast something to a TV, and personally that's working great for you, this probably isn't a feature that you're necessarily interested in. But if you're somebody who wants to have kind of like your very own Netflix, that you can have all your friends and family log into and access, or just have a native application on various platforms around your home to instantly have access to all of your media, this could be something that is 
awesome for you. There are a variety of applications that will allow you to achieve this. There's Plex, MB, Jellyfin, those are kind of the big three. And they all essentially do the same thing. And if you want to kind of rundown of some of the differences, I will link to a video down below in which I cover that and I talk about what I'm currently using. But they're all great for just organizing your media, streaming them. Most of them have applications everywhere. They, they all work great. Beyond this, there's tools for specific types of media, such as ebook libraries, audiobooks, podcasts, and a lot more. And in addition to these, you can actually use some media organizational and acquisition tools that really just takes everything to the next level. I'm not really going to talk about that too much, but I did a video touring all of my kind of home lab services. You can check that out or just do some research into the R suite of tools. Out of all those though, one of my personal favorites is something called Overseer. This gives you a beautiful user interface to help you discover new things. You can see all different like TV shows, for example, of, from all the different streaming services. And you can like sort those based on what's popular overall. It just makes it really easy for content discovery. It is a beautiful tool. Three, DNS and VPN services. First starting off with DNS. And this just means domain name server. The best way to think of DNS is kind of like a phone book, actually linking the domain name to the IP address that a website is running behind. And you've probably even switched up the DNS in your computer settings at one point. You might be familiar with 1.1.1, which is Cloudflare DNS, or even 8.8.8.8, which is Google's DNS server. And those are probably the two most popular DNS providers. And a very popular service that you can run locally is called Pihole. This is a DNS sinkhole that allows for DNS filtering with a primary focus to filter out domains associated with ads on your entire network. It's very customizable. There's really a lot you can do with it for web filtering, monitoring, a bunch of stuff. And this is just one of the examples. There are other services and use cases for hosting your very own DNS server. Now, VPN, and this, this does work a little bit differently than something you might be used to, such as a private internet access or NordVPN. This is going to be running on your hardware, passing through your home network as the VPN server. So, for example, in like a commercial service, you log into their GUI, select a server somewhere else, whether that be some major metropolitan area or even some other country if that's what you need. And then you're essentially searching the web from that specific location. And this is beneficial, of course, for accessing things such as geo-restricted websites and hiding your IP address when you're downloading Linux ISOs, for example. A self-hosted VPN works rather similarly, except for if you're somewhere else in the world and you connect to your VPN, you're routing through to your home network. Also giving you some of the same benefits as a commercial VPN, such as having an encrypted tunnel from wherever you may be in the world to that home network which is really nice for connecting to like public Wi-Fi or something like that. And then of course you can access all of these services, the files and file shares on your network, just like you would if you were at home. Again, shout out to our sponsor Twingate, link to them down below. There are a bunch of different options for setting up a VPN, whether that be specifically VPN, the zero trust networking, lots of different things. Next up, we're going to talk about learning and Home lab. Running a home server gives you the opportunity to create a lab environment, commonly referred to as a home lab. Having access to an environment like this gives you instant access to learn and experiment. For example, you may have a small server like this running somewhere. Maybe you have a virtualization software such as Proxmox running on it. On that, you might have a container for something like Pihole and Plex, and then maybe you have a Linux desktop virtual machine running on it too. Then you see some cool project or something on GitHub and you want to go ahead and try it out. Since you have the infrastructure just ready to go, it is incredibly easy to create new isolated virtual machines or containers in just a few clicks on that specific software and many other software options as well. So you create the new container or virtual machine to test out the service, you play around with it, Maybe it's not for you. In a couple clicks, you delete it, and it's like it never even happened. Something I'm doing right now, for example, is teaching myself basic networking with some TP-Link Omada equipment that I got. And since I have that whole environment already set up, I was able to isolate the new network from my existing network equipment that a majority of the client-side devices are already connected to through Wi-Fi or whatever means. As to avoid the question, what happened to the internet? 
And once I feel confident and I get all the IP reservations and all that set up, I'll be able to switch to the new network. And from a client side, nobody should really notice. Number five, your network internet less. Now I'm not trying to sound like a doomer here, but one of the key reasons I have the setup I have is because if anything were to happen to the internet, my access to it or the data on it, I have my own internet at home. <laughs> That's what I'll tell my kids anyways. <laughs> I have enough services and data that I can really do a lot without actually needing that external internet connection. Did you know the entirety of Wikipedia with images is only 109 gigabytes? Every few months a snapshot is available to download and it can be easily viewed and navigated with a Zim viewer or server. Many TED Talks are open source. Most of the wikis including technical Linux wikis such as ArchWiki, uh, Ask Ubuntu, all those are open sourced and easily downloadable. I can have a Minecraft server running in the background for later use. With all the other services that I've talked about in this video, I mean, we're good to go. <laughs> and of course, there are many, many other services and categories of tools that you should probably have running locally, whether that be your security system. Do you really want to depend on a cloud company and have your live feeds transmitting to them all the time? Probably not. Is your Google Home really going to be there for you when things aren't working right? No matter what your use cases are or what you need, you, you should probably at least get something like a little mini PC, throw a service or two on, just play around, have fun, learn, and eventually you'll be a nerd like me. <laughs> Who scours GitHub trending looking for more things to play around with, add, and talk about here. Speaking of talking about here, I will be talking about a lot more stuff here. so. Do subscribe so you don't miss any future content. And with all that, I do hope you have an absolutely beautiful day. Uh, anything I mentioned will be linked down below, so do check out those resources. And good. Bye.